So good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, tonight our presentation is Help! My amygdala has been hijacked. And I'm, you know, I'm the Chief Organizational Learning Officer for the Children's Guild. And with me this evening is Angelique McCoy. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I am Angelique McCoy, and I am the Talent Development Coordinator at the Children's Guild. And I'm also a licensed professional counselor. Glad to meet you this evening. So before we get started with the presentation, I thought I'd share just a, a, a brief intro to the Children's Guild Alliance. We've been in existence for approximately 65 years. I apologize, there was just a noise and my dog is going a little bit nuts. Uh, so with the Children's Guild, we offer a continuum of services from non-public special education schools, charter schools, we have group homes, behavioral health services, as well as therapeutic foster care. Angelique and I both work for the Transformation Education Institute, which is the training, research, and um, development division of the Children's Guild Alliance. At our organization, our vision is to change the way America cares for and educates its youth. And to that end, we embrace the whole child approach, which is what we're going to share with you this evening. So here are just some little housekeeping tips for this webinar, realizing that we are in a very different time and space um, and as it pertains to our online learning now that we're going through the pandemic. So we want you to first know that the uh, recording is going to be happening throughout the process so that we can then capture this workshop to share out again, again at a later date. We do ask that if possible that you turn on your videos. I know it's late in the day. Some of us may not have, you know, have our freshest face on. We're tired, we're driving. But if you can, we'd love for you to turn on your videos so that we can engage um, with one another. Bear in mind, we completely understand that we are all in this together. So we're expecting to see your family members walk through the camera. You'll hear your pets. We don't mind. We want to just come together as a learning community and stay engaged and speak our truth. We are definitely going to be using the chat feature this evening. So feel free to share your thoughts, ask questions. We're going to try to monitor that throughout the entire workshop and make sure that all of the questions are answered as quickly as possible. And of course, we'll, if we don't get to you, we'll definitely make sure that we jot your questions down and answer those later. So be ready, be open. And let's have some fun. All right, so let's get started. So with the onset of COVID-19, our lives changed, making sure that families were having to make very rapid decisions. Hence the idea of ready, fire, aim. We had to assess our opportunity, begin to act, and then make adjustments along the way. So as our target shifted, it resulted in a tremendous amount of uncertainty for us. Uncertainty about childcare, schooling, and homeschooling our children, our employment, our food, medical services, even where to find toilet paper changed, and how do we care for our loved ones. And now with the new, new reopening phase, we're facing some very different challenges and some new questions. Things like, is it safe to go out to a restaurant? What do I do if I have to return to work? What do I do with my children? Can they go to camp? Is that safe? So there's a lot of questions that we are having to take this ready, fire, aim approach. So it's much like building a plane in flight. And the tagline for this pandemic has been, we are all in this together. And that's for sure. For the past three months, We've all been trying to build this plane and make it fly so that our life can go on. Each one of us has had to reorganize our lives and in many cases our priorities. We've had to come together in ways that were unimagined before this pandemic struck. So for us, this is our new normal. This Zoom and these Google Classrooms and team meetings are what has become our new normal. And it's replete with lots of challenges and struggles as we try to find ways to connect and to make sure that our learning for our children continues as well as our business continues. These changes have permeated every aspect of our lives. And with those changes has come uncertainty. 
which results in a tremendous amount of stress for all of us. So let's pause for a minute and think about this question. What changes did you have to make to adjust to the new normal? If you could jot down a couple of things that have, you've had to change in our chat box, we'd love to share them out and hear what you've done. I know for me, Kelly, while we're getting some feedback, one of the things that I've had to do was to actually really learn how to stick to a formalized schedule, making sure that I carve out some time to work as well as some time to take care of myself. We have some of our participants who are dealing with job loss. Mm -hmm. We have some who have been working on the computer all day long instead of teaching. Being home with their children, that's a very, very uh, big issue now, working and having your kids, adjusting the home schedule while going to work, yep. and then having things delivered instead of going to the stores, making sure that we're keeping ourselves safe. Some have even prepared a new office space. You've got virtual work going on. Not being able to be with your family and your grandchildren and, and those family members that don't live in the home. We have some who are now having to stay with their elderly relatives. And then some people have had to cancel a lot of travel. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, there's a lot of changes that all of us have made and that has resulted in lots of stress for us. So for some of you, these challenges with technology and learning how to Zoom and how to Google and, and access all of these various ways to connect has been very frustrating. And I can share with you that I probably have looked much like these pictures at different points in my learning curve here. Um, the Mayo Clinic reports that when our body experiences changes that result in this chronic state of stress, it has an impact on our physical health as well. It can have elevated, it resulted in an elevated heart rate, respiration, digestive issues, immune suppression, all kinds of medical conditions as a result of this frustration and stress that we're feeling. So much like this water bottle, that at one point our lives may have had a little bit of flurry and activity, has now become this series of chaos and stress due to all of these new changes that we've rapidly had to try to adjust to. This new normal has resulted in lots of changes to our routines. Some not so bad. Uh, we have a new dress code where it's office on the top and casual on the bottom. It has eliminated our commuting time. So for many of us who traveled an hour or so each way, life's a little easier, get a little more sleep time in there. It has allowed us to spend some more time with our family in, in the home. And for some parents, it's actually giving you more of an opportunity to engage in your children's learning. Because most of the time, children come home and you ask what they did at school and they say nothing. And so this has been an opportunity for you to really get an eye into what's going on in the classroom. The flip side is it's also challenged and compromised our routines. We've had to adjust to new schedules. If you have teenagers in the house, their day doesn't begin until 11, 12, 1 o'clock, and they're up all night. We've had to work on coordinating these new schedules with work and schooling and getting the household chores and meals done. And oftentimes there have been blurred boundaries between work and home and trying to figure out how do we shut off work so we can engage in home. And that has oftentimes been really difficult for many of us. So let's think about this for a minute. What strategies are you using right now to deal with this new demand on your life? For me, Kelly, it would definitely be implementing a true self-care regimen taking time for myself. We have some folks who are making those to-do lists and they're prioritizing. People are planning more and they're celebrating the goodness in others. I love that. Thanks oh, for sharing. Funny. They're picking times and they're sticking to their schedule. 
Lots of people are scheduling, whether it's using digital calendars or writing it down on a pad. I love this one. Folks are turning off their laptops at five o'clock. Walking the dog every day, mm -hmm. practicing gratitude. This is awesome. Really getting outside. And this is a great one, not feeling guilty to say no. How many mm -hmm. times do we constantly say yes to everything? Yes, to getting it done and never being able to say no without the guilt. We have folks who are exercising and meditating. This is awesome. And really trying to accept the way that things are and when it's possible getting outside so that you're not always in the house. Those are great strategies. Many of them I can practice myself, but um, certainly strategies that help us get through this really difficult time. So what do we do? How do we begin to understand, adapt, and cope with this ever-evolving change in our life? One of the things that we've been talking about is what happens when we're overwhelmed, when we're overwhelmed with whether it's just this whole COVID-19 pandemic, when we're overwhelmed with the fear. Some of our participants talked about just having that fear. And we will ask that if you are not muted, if you could mute your line so that we don't have any feedback. Thank you very much. So let's talk about the brain because a lot of the emotions and the feelings that we are currently dealing with start and begin in the brain. At the Transit Institute, we have a way of explaining the brain in the most simplest terms so that you can explain it to children as well as adults. We make brain science ridiculously simple. You see on the slide, we have the hypothalamus and the frontal lobes and the corpus callosum, which we refer to as the Brooklyn Bridge, which is that bridge between the right and the left hemisphere. Of course, the cerebellum and the hippocampus. But tonight, we really want to focus on one specific part of the brain, the part that's giving us all of the issues, and that is our amygdala. Keeping it plain, our amygdala is our palace guard. We have actually two amygdalae in the left and the right hemisphere of our brain. And what they are doing is the amygdala is the source of all of our emotions. But most importantly, it's the source of our fear, it's the source of our sadness, even the source of our happiness and our anxiety. And think about what we've been going through during this COVID-19 period. Think about, are your emotions matching what's actually happening? There are times when I'm just like, uh-oh, uh-oh, I can't go outside, uh-oh, uh-oh, I have to put on gloves, uh-oh, uh-oh, I need a mask. My amygdala is so heightened and it's so aware of what ha what's happening that the level of fear that my brain is experiencing is a result of what is happening in the world. That palace guard, if you've ever been to London, think about that visit to Buckingham Palace, that palace guard is standing, it's waiting, it's watching, it's keeping us safe and it's identifying any threats. That's what's happening in your brain constantly. Your amygdala is constantly watching, waiting and assessing. And when the fear raises up in us, we just get emotional. We begin to get loud. We talk crazy. We start raving our hands. We start screaming. Uh-oh, uh-oh. That's my favorite terminology because the amygdala takes control. And remember, when that amygdala takes control, its job is to solve that problem that's causing you that threat, get you away from the danger immediately. It's to help you escape through that fight, fright, or freeze reaction. It's to help you cope with the threat. Defend yourself as best as you possibly can and ultimately at any cost to help you survive. So think about what it's like when your amygdala is hijacked, when you don't have the capacity to defend yourself, when you don't have the capacity to escape and you're frozen in fear. Some of us have been frozen in fear just because of what our country and our world is going through through COVID-19. But we've got some solutions for you tonight. When your amygdala is hijacked, you are going to feel everything at an excessive level. The fear is going to be magnified. The anger is going to be magnified. The aggression, everything, your fight, your fright, and your freeze reactions are going to be magnified. So remember, anything that transpires when your amygdala is hijacked, you are going to regret it 
you're probably going to have to pay for it later because those reactions are usually stemmed in emotion. So tell me, let's go back to the chat. How do you manage your emotions when you're feeling stressed? When you're feeling like your amygdala is hijacked, when you're feeling that, uh-oh, when you're feeling those emotions that are rising to the top and you can't control them, how do you manage? Talk to us. Let's share in the chat. Well, we have lots of great ideas already. We have people that are dancing, they're working out, they compartmentalize things to help keep their priorities straight. They go outside, they coach themselves, they breathe, they play music and video ga games, they count their blessings. They go thrift shopping with a friend. Uh, they escape in their mind, they pray, they walk, they get distracted and, until they can vent. Loud music, eating, journaling, all great ideas. Um, someone likes to crochet and bake. Um, lots of prayers, talking to friends, sometimes quiet time alone, practice mindfulness, uh, chase sunsets. Beautiful. Right. This is lots awesome. Of really this great so ideas. Awesome. Thank, Thank you for sharing. so much. This is awesome. I think it's really important that we have those tools in our toolbox. Often, we don't know how to care for ourselves when our emotions are overloaded. And it's important to have some go-tos. It's important to pray. It's important to be grateful. It's important to read that good book. It's very important to pick up the phone and in this day and age, try to physically FaceTime or house party or something where you can lay your eyes on someone near and dear and share those emotions. Because when our emotions are high, our reasoning is usually very low. And so we need to take that time to be still and to rest and to catch our breath. I love that someone said breathe, and not only did they say breathe, but they said it in caps with dot, 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 meaning that there is more to come and that this is a continual process. Managing our emotions is a continual process that takes practice. All right, so how do we stop this cycle? Summer is just beginning, and our children have been home since mid-March. So some of you may be experiencing the end of summer boredom, and it's just beginning. So how do we cope? How do we take care of our children and ourselves? One of the ways we do that is through our ABCs, awareness, breathing, and control. In order to seek the balance between home and work and our parenting, and raising our children and completing our household responsibilities, we have to give ourselves permission to care for ourselves. And many of us are nurturers who are in the service industry and take care of everyone else. And at this time, when we're under stress and frustration is mounting, we need to give ourselves permission to take time for ourselves, to make mistakes, to make those adjustments and then try again because there's no roadmap for what we're going through. We have to set a new course and a new direction. So we're on an adventure and we're gonna figure this out. So the first thing we're gonna take aware, uh, a look at is that awareness. Awareness is becoming aware of the fact that you're becoming stressed. And when your amygdala becomes activated, we feel it in our bodies. We might have an increased heart rate. You might feel tightness in your jaw. You might get the sweaty palms, rapid breathing. And you might also have things like fatigue, insomnia, um, headaches, as a result of the amygdala being activated and you not taking the time to calm the amygdala and the brain down. You have to give yourself permission during this stage to take time for yourself to calm down your brain and take care of your physical well-being. So let's think for a moment. How often 
are, do you take time to take care of yourself? Now be honest with yourself. Are you taking time both now and prior to this to take care of yourself? Share with us in the chat box about how much time do you take care of yourself? Well, we already have people saying not often enough. Good thing is we have some who are doing it every day, maybe at least 30 minutes or so. Some almost never. Yeah. Some are taking a lot of time, two hours walking, meditating each evening, first thing in the morning. Of course, calendar tends to dictate our lives. But there are several people who just aren't doing it enough. Some read and some know that they need to take more time for themselves. And that's where that scheduling might come in handy to really schedule some time in for yourself and not feel selfish about doing it. Because before you can care for others, you've got to be able to take care of yourself. So breathing is our next area that we want to take a look at. And breathing is what connects our body and our brain. There was a study at the Feinstein Institute for Medical Research and what it indicated was that when there is activity in the amygdala, what happens is our breathing rates increase. And that triggers feelings of anxiety, anger, and fear in us. And as we just said, when we start to feel our emotions building, our reasoning decreases. So let's practice some of the breathing together. This is just a, a breathing uh, visualization that will help you. So we're gonna inhale deeply, exhale, inhale, exhale, inhale in. Notice that your body is starting to feel relaxed. If you find that your mind is drifting Try to keep it focused on just your breathing without trying to change your breath at this point. Let's do one more together. Inhale deeply. And exhale. Great job, everyone. So now let's turn our focus to the last area, which is control. So when you start to feel that amygdala being activated and you start to feel those strong feelings, whether it's anger or aggression, and you start to get into that fight, flight, or freeze response, what we need to do is try to regain control. So the first thing is that awareness. Take a break. Stop what you're doing and give yourself permission to regain control. Do your breathing exercises. Start to calm the mind down so the body can relax and we can begin to get into the reasonal, reasoning and rational brain. Sometimes movement helps calm our bodies. So things like walking, yoga, dance, exercise, mindfulness. Some people like to play the air guitar or play the drums. Any way that we start to get some movement into our bodies. I like to use those bands a lot, particularly when I'm on Zoom meetings and I've been sitting all day. At least it gives me some movement in my body. Perhaps you're gonna take a walk to the refrigerator and get a snack. We recommend that you use some brain healthy snacks such as blueberries, nuts, avocados, or maybe my favorite, which is dark chocolate. But give yourself permission to calm yourself. And once you've done that, then you can begin to think about a rational solution so that you don't have to go back and feel regret for what you said. Let's engage in the breathing, the awareness, the breathing, and taking control so that you can make good decisions. So what are some other strategies you, that you have used to relieve your stress and calm your emotions. And because this is G-rated, we'll keep it to the legal ones. So working out is a big thing. 
whether it's yoga or some other form of exercise. I love this, laughing, listening to music, walking in the garden, and cooking, reading the Bible, going for a drive, tanning, cleaning. Yes, cleaning can be very, mm -hmm. very calming depending on who you are. Listening to podcasts, it's a big one. And playing with your grandchildren, engaging with your family after 7 p.m., closing down the kitchen <laughs> so that you don't have to keep washing dishes, spending time with friends and gentle TV, celebrating the little things. That's awesome. Those are all really great ideas. And I myself, I'm a big fan of the exercise. So we've got some apps that we'd love to share with you if perchance some of the things that were spoken this evening you have not done or you're looking to add some new tools. Um, think about connecting in a different way, especially because now during this time, we've learned how to connect via the internet more than ever. If you're thinking of having some real-time social connections, you can go to House Party, which is a really great app that includes games as well as that visual feature and the WhatsApp. You can chat as well as see your family and friends. And then of course, there are some great relaxation apps that are available, Calm, Abide, Soul Time. They all give you the option to meditate, whether it's meditating on the word, the scriptures, whether it's meditating on anything that you want. And then of course, there are some health and fitness apps. Knowing that we are home and that we are, most of us, remote workers and not really getting as much exercise in some instances as we should, fitness apps are a really great way at home to get that energy going. Planet Fitness, I believe they're reopened, but they still have their app going where they're doing real-time workouts. And think about if you have a Fitbit like me, if you're counting those steps, Remember, the American Heart Association wants you to get in at least 10,000 steps per day. If you're a yogi, you can do Asana Rebel, which is a really great app filled with many, many programs at all levels. Running, walking, it doesn't matter how fast or how slow. What matters is that you get up and you get moving. All right, so now what can you do to help your child? Um, first of all, children are going to imitate what they see you doing. So helping to model the ABCs, the awareness, the breathing, and the control will help your child understand how you deal with the stress and frustrations. Recognize the signs that your child's amygdala is becoming activated. Start to notice what those triggers are, <coughs> excuse me, and understand how to help your child recognize that within themselves. So recognizing the body states, recognizing the fact that they may start to feel anxious or frustrated, and that will then lead them to dealing with these emotions and these feelings in a more constructive way. One of the strategies I wanna talk about with you tonight is called the first then board. And oftentimes this is used with younger children and it helps them understand that first we need to complete a task or a chore and then we begin to have time for the preferred activity. And it could be either playing or drawing or video or snack, things of that nature. So let's take a look at how it works. So in the first column, what you would have would be the assignment. It could be when you're, they were in the schooling process it could be a worksheet, maybe a math worksheet that the child had to complete. So the child then understands that when that one math worksheet is completed, then they get their preferred activity. So in this case, it might be playing a video game such as the Lego movie. Um, so in this process, what children begin to understand is how to pair a required task with a desired task. And now that we're in summer, one of the things we may think about is how to pair this for the chores that the children have to do at home. So first they do their chore, and then they have time to engage in their, their preferred task. As we get into some of our summer activities for school, you might be able to think about having the child do some of their summer reading or math problems, and then get into the preferred activity. 
For our older children, we use something a little bit different, but the same idea. What we do here is we allow the child to determine the order in which they want to complete the task. So what the, what the child would do is identify all the tasks that needed to be done in a particular day. And they then can prioritize the task based on how they like to get things done. So for instance, some, some children like to do challenging things first and get them out of the way. Other children like to do an easier task and build up to the more challenging ones. Some children even need to put a break in there to remind themselves that after they do that task, there's an opportunity for them to take some time to themselves. This is also a great life skill that many of us use in adulthood. For us, maybe we're putting it on our phones. We're using those electronic planners and reminders. For some of you, you use the reminder for this evening's webinar to say, oh, it's almost time to get online. Some of us make to-do lists and check it off to show that we've completed it. And one of my favorites is I like to use Post-its. And so when it's done, I get to take it down, crumble it up and get rid of it to show that I've finished a task. But what we're doing with this scheduling process is we're preparing our children for adulthood. We're teaching them time management, how to be independent, and how to self-regulate throughout the course of the day. One of the cautions I have for you here is about recognizing your own priorities. So sometimes as parents, our priorities get in the way. So for instance, in my particular case, I like to do things in the morning, but my children don't necessarily have that same priority. And so as we're teaching children to be independent, we have to let them make those decisions and those choices. So my question for you is, how have you provided your child with the choice over tasks to be completed? Take a moment and share your thoughts with us in the chat box. While we're sharing, I, I have to say that I absolutely love this particular tool because again, it does not matter the age, children, young adults, adults, ourselves, that we can really use the schedule to, to give us the tasks and the choices that we need. I personally use this one in our home with our daughter who has special needs and she is a young adult and she still is able to decide whether she'll do this particular task first, whether she'll do her schoolwork, maybe she'll start at nine instead of starting at seven. But again, giving her that schedule and then she and I, sit, she and I sitting together and planning her day gives her the opportunity to make the choices about her schedule, which means that she'll probably get the things done because they are her choices. So we have some folks who are generating lists who give the children choices between the preferred task and the less preferred task. They let them choose to do the task within a certain time frame. As long as there is no deadline, they give them an order to complete it, even if there is a deadline. Sometimes children can choose what they want to do first. We have a lot of folks who are choosing to let their child choose the preferred task, but ultimately giving them choices. Thank you all for sharing. Yes, awesome. That's great. By giving them the opportunity to make choices, you are really helping them on the road to independence. So another tool that we use are called fidgets, or in other words, a kinesthetic learning tool. Fidgets help children and adults to work on being able to concentrate and focus our attention on a task when we're filtering out all that extrasensory information. Um, Dr. Ayers, was the first individual to identify this relationship between the behavior and the brain, which she called sensory processing or sensory integration. And basically what that means is that our senses take in information from our environment, which is the sensory processing. And that then becomes food for our brain. It provides the energy and the knowledge that our brain needs to figure out what type of response we need to give to those senses and the stimuli coming into our body. Fidgets allow us to help regulate that because some of us have overactive sensory systems. So they might be hypervigilant around noises or around textures 
or things of that nature. Some of us really struggle with tags on our clothes because we can feel it on our body the entire time. So fidgets are a way of helping us to focus our attention. The one on the top left is called a spinner. And they were popular a couple years ago and still are around where children just kind of spin it in their, in their hand or their fingers and, and watch as it moves around. Some of them actually have tactile, tactile senses built into them. The one underneath that is called a flippy chain. And basically what you do with that is you can twist it and configure it in different shapes. Sometimes you can make letters and numbers and sometimes just various geometric shapes with it. On the right hand side, we have a stress ball and they come in all different sizes and shapes and children just like to squeeze them when they're feeling frustration. The middle one is actually a resistance band. And oftentimes we think of a resistance band as using it with our hands to pull it across. But in this case, what we do is we put it on the, the rungs of the chair so that children can use it for resistance. So children can stomp on it or push against it to get that sensory feedback without having to get out of their seats. And these are all just great tools that we have. My water bottle is also another tool where it can help children use it as a calming activity. So as the glitter settles to the bottom, it helps them thinking about calming their own self. One of the things that I frequently hear is, aren't fidgets distracting? And isn't that actually going to take the child's attention away from the task at hand? And the answer is no, that it actually calms the brain. And so initially, children might be tempted to play with the fiddle diddles, but then as they become used to the idea that they're there for concentration and focus, children be, can be then able to put their attention on the task at hand. Think about adults. How many of you doodle when you're in a meeting or when you're trying to do a difficult task? There's also the adult coloring that has become very popular as a way of helping to calm and relax the brain. So fidgets can really help not only our children to calm themselves, but also can help us when we need to increase our focus. So timers is another tool that I think is really helpful for children because time is such an abstract concept. Uh, so by, by providing them with a visual representation of time, it helps them to better monitor what that elapsed time looks like. And for those of you who are parents or educators, you know that if you tell a child, I want you to stay on that task for about five minutes, within about 30 seconds, they're saying to you, are my five minutes up yet? Because it's that sense of elapsed time that is so abstract. And they have no concept of how to judge how much does five minutes feel like? And so by providing um, various forms of timers, it helps children to measure that. We like to use the red timer, so as the red disappears, their time is up. And so for children that can't tell time, this is a great way of understanding when the red is gone, your time is finished. So by using timers, it helps children to adjust their own pacing, and it gives them a better sense of time management. Sorry about that, guys. How do your priorities impact your child? Let's share some of that with each other in the chat line, please. So for me, and I love to share first, for me, it's actually been an eye opener because my priorities were clearly more important when I was out in the world and as I became a remote worker and a stay-at-home mom slash teacher slash daily three meal a day cook slash all those other things that we all have now added to our titles my daughter's priorities have 
really risen to the top and what's important is that she gets the work done in the time that she wants to get it done. And just again, there's been a whole a mind shift during this time. Exactly. We have some folks who are still talking about the tools and have used the timer. We have suggestion for kinesthetic sand, which is quite useful, especially if you have anyone who is on the spectrum in your life that you are working with, whether it's a child or whether it's an adult. What about those priorities? And this is a tough one when you really think about it and being, being tra transparent and being open enough to say, I had to change some things. Right. And it is hard. It is hard to understand that sometimes our priorities are the trigger that activates their amygdala. Oh, I love these. I have to share these. So we have some, some parents who, because of where we are in the world and watching their parents do their work, they've started to feel more grown up because now they have an, a, a schedule that they have to complete. They're starting to have children following the lead at home, which is awesome, doing what they see being done. So we're being examples for our kids in and out of the home. Kids have learned how to work, how to pay bills, how to be on professional Zoom meetings. We've been <laughs> showing a great example, waiting to do the dishes. It's pretty awesome. Great, that's really great. All right, so the last system that I wanna share with you tonight is called a queuing system. And so cueing systems help us to convey messages when our emotions begin to override our reasoning. And as we talked about earlier, when the amygdala becomes activated and is in a chronic state, what happens is the emotions take over. And that's when we get into that regrettable behavior. So developing a cueing system helps us to provide a way to let each other know that we need a break. So if your child is one who struggles with frustration, perhaps the card on the left is a good tool for them, where they could just put that on their computer if they're working on a, a, a task for school, or maybe they hang it on their door and just say, listen, I'm frustrated right now, I need a break. Same thing with the tool on the right-hand side, where sometimes a child just needs a break. Maybe the task they're doing is something that they just are not able to cope with at the moment, and they need to take a break and relax. And that's exactly what we want to model with them, is that awareness of when your brain becomes activated and you start to feel that anxiety and that stress, then we start our breathing and take control. And a break is a great way to do that. One of the programs we use in many of our schools are called the zones of regulation. And so on the bottom, you see the, the card that says, what zone are you in? And what this does is it teaches children how to equate their emotional states with preferred activities that help them to deescalate and get into a much calmer state. So it's a great opportunity for children to begin to associate the feeling states they have in their body with how their emotions are, and then figure out how do they engage in self-regulation strategies. So as an adult, we also need to have a cueing system for children. So perhaps you have a sign that says, I'm in a meeting when you're in a Zoom meeting, because that's always when kids need your attention. Or maybe you have a sign that says, I need a break. Maybe you put that on your bedroom or maybe it's on your bathroom that says, mom needs a break for a few minutes, or dad is on a break. Or maybe there's a sign that says, just give me a minute, please. But by having a cueing system that is both parent and child, it models for the children that we all get activated by various stimulation in our environment. And we all have to be responsive to our amygdala so that we can be able to calm our emotions, calm our body, and make rational decisions. So we are at the end of our journey together this evening, and it has truly, truly been a pleasure sharing with you. And what we want to make sure you understand is that there is a lot that we can all learn at any given time in our lives. 
And even though there may have been some things that we may not have gotten as perfect as we wanted, we may have had some emotions that were beyond control. We may have said or done some things in the heat of the fear, in the heat of the fight and the fright and the freeze. Every day is a new opportunity. And at each opportunity chance, we are able to assess, act, and adjust. Because ultimately, in doing those things, we can make the impossible possible. Hopefully you have learned some new tools. We appreciate how you have shared some tools with us. We want you to know that this has been an important time for us as well as it has been for you. And the quote of the day or the quote of the evening that we want you to go home knowing is that today I will do what others won't so that tomorrow you can go do what others can't. Again, thank you so much for joining us. We would like to refer you to our website. You can go to childrensguild.org backslash webinars, and you'll be able to find out any upcoming webinars. You'll also at some point be able to review this current webinar once it is uploaded. Be on the lookout for our monthly webinar series next July, this July, we'll be having our next series. And if you want, you can get today's PowerPoint also at that free resource. And you can also read the companion article that goes along with this particular workshop, Help My Amygdala's Been Hijacked. Any questions or comments, any information that you would like to share with the team, feel free to send us a message at info at transed.org. I have been Angelique McCoy. And I'm Kelly Spinell. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening.